Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Nakul Mandan. I'm with Lightspeed Venture Partners. Uh, we're very proud to be an investor in Gainsight. I will say I have the distinction of being the only person who's invested in Gainsight twice. Um, I, I used to work at Battery Ventures, was part of the deal team who invested in Gainsight the first time at the Series A, and then I moved to Lightspeed, and the first thing I did there was invest in Gainsight again. Um, so uh, we have a great panel for you today. The topic of discussion is Sand Hill Road and the business economics of customer success. Um, you know, traditionally, boardroom discussions were all about growth and uh, profitability and cash. So are you growing? Are you growing profitably? Do you have the cash to continue on, right? Nobody really cared. How are our customers doing? Isn't that shocking? You're in the business of serving customers, but nobody discussed that at the highest levels of the organization. But that's changing in the last three, four years now. Uh, so we have a good mix of CEOs and investors uh, who will talk about that. Why is that changing? What is changing about that discussion? Uh, what's getting discussed about customer success at the boardroom level? So let's welcome our panelists for that. Awesome, so, um, so yeah, as I said, we have a great uh, panel of CEOs and investors. Uh, so maybe starting from you, uh, introduce yourself, give, give maybe a 60 second background, and then also talk about why is customer success becoming important at the boardroom level? Sure, thank you, Nicole, so excited to be here. My name is Monica Enan, I'm the founder and CEO of a company called Zapproved. We sell to corporate legal departments and help them with the discovery phase of litigation. Uh, we're a subscription service and have been expanding our product line as our customers have discovered that the changing IT landscape for them is presenting more problems. And so for our board, you know, churn is the enemy. It's kind of like inflation to the Fed. Um, it's the enemy of growth, right? Um, and we're, as we expand the product line, it becomes even more important that our customers are ridiculously happy and that they trust us to solve their problems because we can grow add-on services and add-on products uh, along with uh, our original subscription product. Great. Rita? Hello. Thank you for having me here. Uh, my name is Rita Brogley. I'm the CEO of MyBuys. Um, MyBuys is an e-commerce software company that um, personalizes interactions between retailers and their shoppers. And we do that across a suite of products um, on the website in personalized email and in personalized display advertising. And um, I actually joined MyBuys. My first role with the company was as the chief customer officer. So I am living proof for Nick, wherever he is, that uh, you can get promoted into a CEO role from that. And um, for MyBuys, we you know, we build profiles of shoppers, and the, the shopper, the consumer, is at the center of everything that we do. And when we think about customer success at MyBuys, we, we want to have that same roadmap in mind, if you will, with the customer, our customers always at the center. And if you're a, a SaaS company, half of your, and, and you're successful, at least half of your revenues are coming, you know, from that recurring revenue stream of your customers. So there's nothing more important than making sure that your customers are happy, that they're renewing, that they're your best advocates. Um, and so it is uh, something that we believe in. Uh, you know, it's at the heart and soul of our company. Donna? Thanks. Uh, my name is Donna Wells. I'm CEO of MindFlash. And we're a Palo Alto-based online training company. So all of the employee training that you all are trying to get done live and in person and struggling with because you're hiring so quickly, um, we're the platform that helps you get that up into the web uh, and make it happen at scale and very cost effectively. Um, the other, uh, I will echo what uh, my colleagues have said about the importance of a customer-centered strategy for success in a SaaS business. We have another dimension to customer success at MindFlash, 
we also empower our customers training of their own customers. So you think about a, a company like Gainsight or a company like Yammer or a company like Intuit in Canada, they have thousands, uh, hopefully tens of thousands of customers to train and only a few hundred employees. That math just doesn't hunt. So we provide them the platforms on which they can upload and host their own customer training so that certification can happen in real time seven days a week, 24 hours a day to help you scale the revenue generating side of the business and also increase customer satisfaction as a result because they're well trained in your product and they're getting great value out of it. So if we look at customer support in our customer success, both dimensions. Great, I'm, I'm Brett Rockhind. Um, honored to be in this panel. I think uh, this is the most diverse panel we've talked about uh, before, <laughs> so I'm, I'm proud to be here. Um, so I'm at General Atlantic. We're a, a global growth equity firm, manage about 20 billion, um, focus on basically investing in five geographies, five sectors. Uh, I co-head what we do in the internet technology area, but we also invest in financial services, healthcare, uh, retail consumer, uh, and business services, and we invest across uh, geographies. About half our investments are outside the U.S., so very active uh, in Asia, Europe, Latin America. Um, in the internet technology area, a big emphasis, and even just as a firm, is around customer success. Um, so we were investors uh, originally in, in companies like Service Source, um, and very active today in companies like Box. I think you just heard from John earlier, uh, as well as um, uh, Aperio, uh, Mu Sigma. Uh, Bizarre Voice and a number of other companies focused on the enterprise. Uh, we look at customer success as producing great superior returns for our limited partners and being highly referenceable and doing a great job working on behalf of our portfolio companies. So we'll talk a little bit later about some of the things we do. My name is Dathina Tancheva. I'm one of six investment professionals at U.S. Venture Partners. It is an early stage IT and healthcare firm. We've been around for 32 years. We're usually the first or the second institutional investor in the companies that we back. Uh, on the IT side, we focus on four, uh, four areas. Uh, we focus on enterprise companies, uh, cloud infrastructure companies, security is a big area of focus for us, and um, uh, select segments in consumer. Uh, companies that uh, uh, on the SaaS side that you might have, uh, that you might be familiar with, that we have been involved with, including Yammer, uh, Box, uh, Inside Sales, which has been prominently displayed here behind us, um, act on in the marketing automation space, um, et cetera. Um, customer success is an important metric for us to track, not only um, on the board, uh, not only as board members, but also internally within our partnership during portfolio reviews, because we think of it as one of the most important metrics that measures the health of the businesses that we back and also educates the strategic direction that um, we as board members are um, responsible for uh, overseeing uh, that our companies take. Great. Uh, so maybe I'll kick it off with the CEOs on, on the panel. Um, so, you know, as you guys are beginning to discuss uh, customer success at the board level, what are some of the key metrics you track and present? Uh, and it'll be good to get some idea on what beyond the obvious metrics, so churn and upsell, but what beyond that comes in that discussion? Yeah, uh, my board is very interested in not just signing a customer, but really that engagement with the customer. And as a proxy for that, you know, we've got multiple types of things that we try to use as a proxy for that engagement, but usage and implementation time and onboarding, um, all of that is a regular, uh, part, regularly part of the deck. Yeah. Uh, the other thing, obviously, we use is NPS. And NPS has been really useful to us. It's been a, a little bit more of an early warning seg signal for um, potential issues with customers. Rita? So we, uh, part of our business is, uh, is SaaS and the other part is performance-based. So we look at things like uh, revenue retention, so by, by customer, by product, um, that helps us really see if there are you know, any early warning signs of, of things not going well. Um, we also, of course, measure you know, logo churn and things like that. But for us, revenue retention, um, you know, you know, is, is really one of the best ways that we can measure it. Um, we also are looking pretty closely at 
um, the revenue that we can drive for our clients by product. And so we can look at campaign performance, we can look at the results of A-B tests. We have A-B tests running um, all the time across all our products for our clients. And um, oftentimes they don't even realize that those tests are being run, but we can see in advance if there's anything that's not going well, um, and then we can begin to make some changes. Um, and then the other is really just the receptivity that our, that our clients have um, to uh, engaging with us. So we look at overall engagement rate on a, on a regular basis. Donna? So the tough thing about going third in this line is a lot of uh, struggle to come up with something new and interesting. Um, we also look at MPS in addition to the, the usual suspects. Um, I will say we look at MPS by industry, we look at MPS on a specific customer success manager by customer success manager basis, so we slice it pretty thinly. Um, interesting finding for us over the last six months is um, lack of response to a net promoter score survey is actually a much bigger predictor of trouble in the account than responding and giving us a high, low, or medium score and a, a promoter, detractor, or passive. Yeah, so if your customers aren't responding to NPS surveys, and we do them quarterly at this point, that's a, a red flag in and of itself. Uh, my board is uh, obsessed with the uh, churn. Uh, they got into SaaS very early. I think their first SaaS investment was probably in the year 2000. Uh, so they really understand the importance of a, a healthy churn rate to um, the growth and success of the business. Um, we actually share the verbatims from every client that's left us in between board meetings with the full board, just direct quotes. And that's really helpful in putting color and emotion behind reasons that people might be leaving us. Interesting. And Monica, you mentioned implementation timeline as a key metric on customer success. Are the two of you also beginning to see that time to first value is part of the customer success discussion or uh, it's a separate discussion? We do, we have a much less formal implementation process than Gainsight does. Um, but in our world, it's the time to get their first course up and running, and even more importantly, the time that they start to see course completions coming in from their trainees. Um, it's a little different in our world. 85% uh, of people that are gonna start a course on Mind Flash get it done by themselves in the first 24 hours of their free trial. So we put a ton of investment into ease of use. Um, but they've got to be getting real trainings through real content to get the value from the product. So, yeah, key metric. We have a pretty formal um, and somewhat lengthy uh, implementation process that can go from three weeks to three months because we're ingesting all the catalog and product data and transaction data from retailers. There's a lot of information. Everything has to be tagged. Um, and honestly, if that implementation doesn't go well, you just, that process, that, that you know, client really never becomes a true client. So there's so many areas there where we're trying to, uh, you know, on an ongoing basis, take, um, you know, the learnings from our client success team that doesn't really get involved in the implementations, that's just professional services, bring them into the discussion sooner so that we can make sure that it's a really great experience and kind of track things along the way so that we can get them through the implementation successfully, get them live, and then also, um, you know, over time, they'll choose to, uh, you know, upsell and, and purchase other products. So for us, it's sort of a make or break if the implementation doesn't go well. Got it. And from an investor point of view, you know, traditionally investors are all about growth, uh, especially if you're on the early or growth stage company side. Uh, are you guys beginning to see in boardroom discussions that you guys sit on multiple boards, so are you seeing across the board that customer success is becoming an important area of discussion? And from your point of view, how important is it? Because at the end of it, you invested because the company needs to grow. Um, so, Yeah, I mean, it, I, I think as, as Dafina said earlier, I mean, it's probably one of the most important factors whether we actually make the investment in the first place is looking at customer cohort data, whether that's looking at a consumer internet company, a retail company, a financial company, or a SaaS company. You know, that's the first sign of, of whether the company is succeeding, whether it's retaining its customers. And we very much look at it even in terms of valuation. I mean, we did an interesting kind of study and correlation 
And if you look at um, you know, the, the set of public SaaS companies today, and you were to look at them on whatever you could perceive in the public market to be kind of the retention rate, you'd find that you know, anywhere between um, every kind of two points of retention dictate into somewhere between 10 to 20% of what their forward revenue multiple would be. And that's a huge difference. You know, that, the difference between uh, an 88% renewal rate and a 90% renewal rate is tremendously different um, in the valuation that ultimately that company has. Um, the second part we look at is customer acquisition cost. I mean, today, uh, you know, it's costing, if you look at magic numbers of 0.6 or uh, in some cases even 0.5. I mean, you're spending effectively $2 to acquire uh, $1 of customer revenue. And if you think about um, just that cost and the lifetime value of that customer, it's incredibly important that you retain that customer because that'll change the equation of whether you uh, can afford to spend that money or whether you need to spend much less in customer acquisition so that drives growth. So it's at the core of everything that we look at. Uh, yeah, so my view is that customer success as a concept is still pretty early in its, its um, uh, uh, life cycle. Uh, I think uh, companies define it differently depending on the business, which is probably uh, right in some ways, but I think many companies out there, at least from my experience, uh, start thinking almost too late about customer success. Uh, they start thinking about customer success when there is churn or when there is um, uh, when there's customer churn or when there is low customer engagement and, and growth is impacted. And I think that at that time, it's almost, it's almost too late. So what we do as an early stage firm that uh, uh, leads Series A financings when the team is still um, only 10 people and there are no processes in, in the company in place and no metrics, um, what we try to do is to um, uh, encourage the CEO and the management team to think about what the CEO dashboard looks like and to make sure that customer success um, is well defined and is very well tracked in that CEO and, and board um, uh, uh, dashboard. And the other thing that I want to say about customer success is that, um, again, we talk a lot about customer churn and customer engagement, but I think that customer success is one of those metrics that uh, needs to be followed um, and means different things uh, during the, li the life cycle of the customer, from the moment the customer is captured. And usually customer success at that time means what was the customer experience with the sales process? What was the customer experience with the implementation process? Then in the, um, uh, uh, once the customer is on board, the customer success becomes all about engagement and uh, level of satisfaction with the service. And then in, 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 in the end, um, it's about um, customer success is measured in terms of renewal, in terms of expansion, in terms of uh, buying more, more features, more, more products uh, from, from the product line. Um, so we do want to be very, again, thoughtful and very proactive and strategic about how we define customer success in each of the companies that we work with, uh, what set of metrics um, are meaningful to be measured, um, and, uh, and, and set, that, um, uh, uh, set that habit, uh, develop that habit early so that uh, we, can, we can have a company that's, that's healthy, a business that's healthy and that is growing nicely. And you know, uh in the sales and marketing world, people have come up with metrics like SaaS magic number to kind of measure the efficacy of the sales and marketing spend. Uh, I'll start with the investors, but from your perspective, how do you guys measure the ROI on the spend on customer success? Maybe, Dafina, you can... Yeah, I mean, the, the main way that we look at it is, you know, if you go back to that LTV equation, um, you, know, you think about the life cycle of customer, you know, there's two metrics, right? So you have, look at the upfront payback that you have at the time of the, the actual um, close of the sale. And if you think of, if your magic number is 0.5 again, that's $2 that you're spending. So if you think of over time, that means that you need at least, uh, if you take gross margins of let's say 70, 80%, you need at least three years of customer life to actually think about, um, you know, if that's your ultimate upfront sales cost, which means you, you better keep a, particularly in a SaaS model or a consumer net model or you gotta keep a customer very happy for a long period of time. The other factor we look at very closely in you know, Box, one of our companies publicly states is their net upsell and net retention. I mean, the easiest sale to make is to your existing customer. And if you think of, if you, if particularly when you're starting with a departmental sale to a division within a large enterprise, making that customer in that department extremely happy and making that person, I think on the chart it says here, getting to the Hall of Fame. I like to think of it as make your customer a hero, right? So if you make that department uh, head a hero, whether it's marketing or finance, they're gonna talk within the company and that's gonna drive additional sales 
that ultimately will drive additional ROI and LTV for that, for that customer, um, which is incredible. And the cost of sales is going to be much cheaper. So it all feeds back to itself, and it all starts with making sure your customers are heroes um, and really delighting them in everything that you do. Yeah, I mean, I, uh, I don't have that much more to add. Uh, you gave a pretty thorough answer. Uh, probably one extra point, uh, and it's very relevant to, again, early stage companies, is that um, we almost don't worry about ROI at that level. We want to make customers successful at, at, at any cost. And sometimes that means margins, margins end up not looking all that good. Uh, and we realize that that is only, uh, hopefully, um, a point in time when that, that is true. So certainly everybody is aware that that's not how you build a sustainable business. But it's so important to make those first 10, 20, 30 customers happy, successful. Uh, the learnings that, you, that the business takes from, from, from that experience, uh, and also all the other side benefits, the, um, uh, uh, the recommendations, the, uh, turning these customers into lighthouse accounts, um, the value is so high that we are willing to take almost um, uh, a negative ROI, you know, spending more, spending more than, we, than we make in the short term on customer success uh, because of the long-term benefits. Yeah, it's an interesting point you make. The first 20 customers, if they become advocates, there's no cost you can attach to that that delivers the ROI. Uh, so, you know, Donna, maybe I'll start with you this time. For, <laughs> don't want you to be the third complaint. CEO to answer every question, but, uh, what are some of the trade-offs that you had to make? You know, you know, you're all running fast-growing early-stage startups. You have limited resources to make customer success an initiative. Have you had to make some trade-offs, and what are they? Yeah, and I think anyone that tells you differently is not being completely truthful. It's more in a world of constrained resources, and uh, no matter what you may say about the the ease of uh, gathering cash these days. Uh, we're all operating with fewer developer hours and fewer man hours and fewer months in the year than we need to accomplish everything that we want to. Um, so we've made some really painful trade-offs. Just over the last year, we spent uh, a couple of months uh, working through some issues we created for ourselves uh, as we were converting our platform uh, to be completely mobile and responsive so trainers and trainees can access courses anytime, anywhere around the world. Um, turns out doing that's pretty hard. And so we uh, pushed back some new feature work that we desperately wanted to do uh, in order to get our, our defect and error rate down to like half of 1%. Um, this year, we're doing uh, a lot of work for a couple of months in a significant redesign. Um, our product was launched originally very much as a minimum viable product, and we've expanded on it uh, sort of exponentially over the last few years, and, and luckily uh, revenue has, has per customer, ARPU, has spiked along with it, so that's worked out well. Um, but we're serving the needs of much bigger companies now, you know, Microsoft and Apple and Uber, uh, so we need to make sure that uh, um, the robustness uh, and the uh, uh, usability for people that have not dozens of courses, but hundreds of courses, and not hundreds of trainees, but tens of thousands of trainees, that the UI and the UX experience is fantastic. The UX experience, that's repetitive. Um, that the UI and UX is great uh, for people that are managing large groups of trainees and large uh, uh, databases of course content. So those have been really painful trade-offs. I, I wish I had those months back. We've got a, a list of features we want to get out the door in arm's length, uh, in arm's length long, but uh, um, customer happiness comes first for all the reasons that you all have mentioned. Rita? Uh, as Donna mentioned, we've, we've made the same trade-offs. You know, you never have enough uh, development resources. We've so desperately wanted to add some features to our products at, at different points in time and instead decided to devote some of those resources to making our onboarding and implementation process more smooth. And, um, you know, salespeople sort of like that, and then they don't because you want to be able to sell something that's new and exciting. But again, if you can't get that client live and do so in a manner that uh, makes them happy and successful in using the product, then, then why bother? And so we have dedicated a lot of resources, uh, even very recently, to onboarding um, and to creating very smooth connections between MyBuys and all the partners in the e-commerce ecosystem that we work with. There's lots of companies, and if you want to speed up the deployment and make it go 
you know, very seamlessly, you really have to invest in, in the APIs and those linkages. Um, the second thing that has been a, an important trade-off for us is really being much more focused on the type of customer that we're um, prospecting and acquiring. So, you know, I'm a big believer, you can't be all things to all people and justify the ROI of customer success because, you know, I think especially as a small company, you have to really know the market that you're going after, who's your target customer, and do you have the products and services that can satisfy that customer, that can delight that type of customer. So we've also really, uh, taken a focused effort to narrowing down that field of customer that we were um, targeting. And that has, uh, I think, really paid off um, nicely because the customers that we know we can serve well um, are happy and, and they're buying more products and, and they're telling their friends about it. So it was a good thing for us. Monica, anything to add to that? Uh, not much. We've yeah. also had to make hard trade-offs. I think we've evolved to this idea that every sprint there is going to be stuff for cu existing customers, stuff for new features, and then chores that the engineering team and all three categories have to be worked on at all times. And so having that culture where everyone understands that all three legs of that are, are important and need to happen all the time makes those trade-off conversations a little easier. In, uh, you know, I think Dafina touched upon this that it is important even at the earliest stages of a startup to have fo a focus on customer success. But from your point of view, uh, especially as CEOs, when do you institute a separate team for customer success? Is it at a certain point of 5 million in ARR, 10, like, or w when do you say we need a VP of customer success and a full department there? Yeah, our department grew out of some innovative people who were doing support and realized they needed to be more proactive and that stickiness and you know growth was important um you know i very much identify and remember the times where we ran around and did not think about roi on customer at all success at all um but at some point the early people in the company actually need to be a little bit reined in i i found i mean those kind of wild crazy people who run around and make customers happy and do at all costs uh, there's a, st a stage at which I had to kind of say, you know, similar to what I think Rita was talking about, we need to, we need to th think about how this is scalable and, and what makes yeah. sense and, um, and rein that kind of in. And that's when the customer success team became really important because it wasn't the founders, the early employees who ran around and just did everything and made quick decisions and they just made it all happen, it was like, oh, well, now we have a customer success team and now they have to actually weigh it and they have to work with product management and product management has to make these trade-offs. Um, so I don't know, it, it kind of happened around 50 customers, I think, to us. Okay, Rita? We had a customer success team early on. It was very small. I think it was uh, two client success managers, one for the East and one for the West, and it grew from there. But it was really after we had probably somewhere in the neighborhood of you know, 20 to 40 customers. And, and then that team grew over time. And um, I think, you know, as Monica's saying, you have to think about the cost to serve customers because it is, it is real. And the more that you understand the type of customer that you're suited to serve and make sure you can do that really, really well, define what those goals are and, and what you need to get done, um, the easier it is to to communicate that within the culture as well. Because just getting everything done, you know, pleasing the customer at all costs at all times doesn't scale, um, and you can go out of business doing that. So you have to really define, you know, what you're doing and, and why. I don't know that I have a number, either in terms of revenue or number of customers or journeys uh, been a little different. For us, the customer success team uh, got created as our, or really in response to our changing um, customer demographics and firmographics. Uh, as we move from offering a product at a price point that was really attractive to early adopters, they were keen to start a trial, get in there, kick the tires, break some stuff, and they were happy about being the first in their industry uh, to move their live training onto the web. Um, those folks didn't need or want a lot of customer success support uh, we moved to a, a sales model that was much more 
um, inside sales and assisted and guided uh, and had a higher percentage of our incoming customers that were really interested in receiving a demo and very much leaning back and wanting us to push all the buttons a little bit more fearful about jumping into the world of, of uh, cloud software. And so as we move through all the phases of the Crossing the Chasm book, uh, we uh, move to add more customer support about the same time that we did uh, more inside sales support. So for us, it was as the product and our market evolved, it sort of became a natural need uh, in the organization to get folks up and running. Got it. Um, and then, you know, we, we've talked about some of the metrics you track, the NPS scores and all of that, but uh, from the board level down, how do you institute a culture of customer success from the earliest days. So maybe I'll start with the investors because y you guys probably see some of that changing also, but how do you kind of encourage the CEO to institute of culture, a culture of customer success from the earliest days beyond the metrics and across the teams? I think I talked a little bit about it uh, earlier as I was answering one of your earlier questions, but uh, almost immediately, um, after we make an investment and during the first board meeting, we talk about the, the set of um, metrics that the board would like to, to track the, the, uh, that need to be reported, uh, that needs to be reported on a, on a board level. And customer success, as I mentioned, is uh, one of those metrics. Um, I think it starts with the founders. So when we look to, to back companies, for us, uh, uh, founders that uh, are focused on the, the happiness, the satisfaction of their customers is very important. It's a, an important uh, due diligence item. Uh, so uh, I, I, it, isn't, it is not our job to, uh, at least that's, it's our view that it is not our job to establish culture. Uh, the culture is established by, by those that work at the company that are there 24 seven and that's usually the founders. So what we look for is founders that are obsessed with the satisfaction of their customers. And what we encourage them is to um, make that um, a priority for everyone else uh, and make it an important hiring decision as they bring other people uh, to the company. And, and again, that's not just the customer success team or the sales team or the marketing team. It, it goes the, all the way down to the developer, to the individual contributor, developer or tester, uh, because um, it, it, everybody at the company has to think about how important customer satisfaction is in order for that to, 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 become, to become true. Yeah, I'd say, I mean, we very much look at, you know, we have one of my companies actually in the information services space. Yeah, it's about a, a 10 billion or so market cap. It's interesting, it's a very free cash flow generating company. Um, they effectively have raised price on their customers year after year after year, something we don't really talk about a lot in Silicon Valley SaaS land. Um, yet they track very closely customer delight. And I remember when the CEO came in and talked about this idea of, you know, it's, they sell a lot to oil and gas companies, they sell a lot to uh, industrial firms, um, and it was, again, a very free cash flow oriented company, and, you know, he, he came in and, and talked about customer delight, and we kind of laughed. We're like, customer delight? It was, were we selling ice cream? <laughs> and um, he's like, no, this is really important, because in, in their case, it, it was, they had, you know, a, a data set they were selling to all these, these companies, they weren't going to lose them. But if they weren't going to delight their customer, there was no chance for upsell. There's no chance to raise price year after year, and uh, shouldn't say raise price, increase the value that they were delivering to their customer, um, and ultimately obviously get paid for that. And so it was a very important thing. And as a result, you know, the company, despite being, you know, when we first invested, was a 3% organic grower, it's now a double digit organic grower. Um, they've acquired a number of different businesses, and they've, they've integrated those, and customers have appreciated and bought products from all those different businesses. But it all started with, Whatever that metric is of customer delight, a lot of people kind of do turn to NPS scores, and I'm not sure those always correlate with um, you know uh, shareholder value and kind of performance. But figuring out for your business how you measure that, you know, obviously there's the core financial metrics around uh, net upsell and churn and so forth. But having some factor um, either in you know the way that you survey, the way that you ask those questions uh, too, and there's a lot of obviously tools that that many companies probably here are selling. But I think figuring out for your industry, for your company, what fits you know, that, that customer in the best way that will correlate with the best answer. And sometimes it'll be NPS, sometimes it'll be other things. And just figuring that out, I think, is important. Um, Donna, Rita, Monica, you guys have some thoughts there? I think it's important to have um, 
all the executives have some tie of their, you know, some of their variable comp tied to customer success. When I joined MyBuys, um, the only team that um, felt any pain if there was churn was the client success team. And I said, that's absurd. I mean, why would, why would you do that? I mean, everyone has a part to play. And so we started to change that. Um, and, and so we do have all of our executives as well as um, individual contributors throughout the company have some portion of their compensation that's tied to um, customer success and the metrics that are relevant to our business. And I have seen a big change in um, you know, the product team, engineering team, how people think about um, what they're doing and, and why um, as it relates to the feedback we've gotten from our customers. So I think it's, it's really important. It's not something you just hand off to the customer success team and then say, you know, good luck with that. Yeah, the only thing I would add is, you know, the common thing I've heard from a lot of people is the whole company owns, owns customer success, and that's been true for our company. Um, and our director of customer success, when she does lunch meeting presentations, makes sure to emphasize that. And, you know, it's written on every whiteboard. It's something we, you know, the executives embody. But I think the other piece, one thing that we do that has been helpful is we always talk about our revenue funnel. So we don't talk about a sales funnel or a marketing funnel. We talk about a revenue funnel. Marketing finds them, sales gets them, and customer success keeps them and, uh, and gets references, you know, c case studies, testimonials, and, and gets them ready for upselling. So because we talk about that revenue funnel as opposed to the distinct pieces, it forces all those teams to realize they can't exist. They, they don't exist without each other. And that each leg, again, in that is, is very important. So. Great. So maybe we'll open it up for uh, some audience Q&A. We have probably time for one to two questions. So any questions from the audience? On here. Hi, I'm Blair Fernandez. I'm with a small company called TalkDesk. And uh, on the previous panel, there were folks from larger companies. Uh, you guys in VC mentioned the, the upsell, the expansion that Box looks at. And uh, Box, AT&T, SAP, someone else, they were all saying that the CSMs actually don't manage upsell because their customers began to feel that every time they talked to their CSM, they were being pitched to, which makes sense. Um, I'm interested from the perspective of smaller companies and you guys who are working with smaller companies, what do you see the role of the CSM being and, uh, and what should it be? Um, I think Go for it. So yeah. Thanks. I think that's a great point. Um, our CSMs are effective where the AEs cannot be effective because the customers trust that when they get on the phone, that CSM is there to make them happy, teach them something, uh, help them, not sell them something. And uh, it's an important part. However, our CSMs are key to finding those upsell opportunities. I don't want them to execute on it. I want them to go grab the AE and bring them into the to the deal. But I want them to have an eye towards it and know where the where where the right opportunities are and where the AEs should spend their time. Don. Uh, so our CSMs are responsible for upsell, uh, and for us that works because the pricing model that we have offers different feature sets at different tiers. And it's really part of customer success, not just you know, uh, greedy revenue grab, um, to move people from, look, your program is growing, it's becoming more complex and sophisticated. You might want to think about customer and in your MindFlash training portal. Or you're thinking about moving from just employee training to training your own customers. Let's talk about custom branding for that portal. Let's talk about your language requirements, local language requirements at that level. So we can have those conversations that, that feel supportive, because guess what? They actually are. They're going to help this uh, customer grow their training program successfully. Um, and we win together. And I think our CSMs have, have really mastered the, um, that conversation so that at the end of it, it does feel like a win-win conversation. But I think the way that, or, 
product is priced and the way we've set up our tiers supports that. In a different pricing model, it might not be possible to have the CSM execute on the upsells as well. In our company, the, the primary responsibility of our CSMs is to be the, the strategic partner, if you will, for the marketers that we work with at the e-commerce retailers, so to help them think about how best to grow their business and to make sure that they're getting the most value out of our software. But they do also upsell. Um, they're primarily responsible for upsells for our mid-market clients and um, often will do some upselling on the enterprise, but in many cases for our enterprise clients, uh, the CSM will bring in an account, you know, a, a salesperson to, um, to assist, but it, it's really kind of up to them to some extent. Um, we find that our client success managers are better suited to engaging our clients and getting them interested in new products without feeling like they're being sold. Um, and we've had really good success with that. But again, as, as you get to bigger and bigger customers, I would say that we would, uh, the tendency would to be to bring in the salespeople for those. Uh, you guys have anything to add? Okay. Right? I think we've run out of time, unfortunately. So thank you guys, and this was a great panel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.